So I'll show you how humans don't work, and then you put the pieces together so when you leave today, you should say to yourself, wow, I've got to reinvent yourself in terms of what you're doing because you're probably not as effective as you could be simply because you don't have the tools that are required to make a difference. Now, I've looked at the program, and there's a lot of great talks that have come before, so I'm going to try and build on those talks and synthesize it. So as a closing presentation, I'm trying to put pieces together. So when you leave, you leave a better person yourself. And if you leave a better person, then hopefully you can spread that to your family, and then your friends, and then eventually work. Does that work for you? That's what I'm going to try and do. But before I start, uh, on, on the webcast in northern Ontario in some little hotel room is a fellow by the name of David Gibson. So David, uh, somebody came up and told me that they know you, so I just want to tell you uh, thanks for all you taught me, I think it was like 30 years ago, about this field. And, and hopefully you're proud I've grown up to be a doctor and uh, all the rest of the stuff. So that's, that's one of those paid political announcements for Dave Gibson. But he probably feels real good in the middle of a room in Ontario and I stop and acknowledge him. All right, so if this works, this is where we're going to start. Now, this is by far the thing that we want to prevent uh, if we can. And in the last 36 hours, I've almost been involved in three collisions. Not that I did anything wrong, but it's obviously, you always blame the other person, but when somebody comes into your lane, I think it's okay to say that they really shouldn't have been talking on their cell phone as they were pulling out of the parking lot and I just happened to see them yapping on their cell phone, pulling out of a parking lot, almost hitting me. And then the other two were equally distracted drivers. So this, this is the stuff that uh, happens when you least expect it. So for those of you that have been here for a long time, you're a little tired. If you're going to try and drive home tonight, there is a storm that may or may not be coming. So you're a prime target for something happening to you. And it always happens when you least expect it. And so you least expect it when you're leaving a safety conference. And many a time when I've given this presentation to people leaving safety conferences, they've phoned me back or emailed me a couple of weeks later and say, hey, remember you even warned me? I was driving home, I fell asleep, and I crashed my car. So that's the kind of stuff I want to talk about. So besides cell phone use, and we're going to end with cell phones as an example, I want you to be really honest. And the only way you can be honest is by closing your eyes. So everybody close your eyes right now. Close your eyes so nobody sees how anyone else answers. How many of you still talk on your cell phone and drive? Put up your hands. Nobody else can see you do this. OK. So three of you didn't put up your hands. Great. That's, that's fantastic. All right. So we're going to talk about cell phones and driving. You can open your eyes. But we're also going to talk about other things that are distractions that cause people to get injured. But before we do that, let, let me take you on a journey. How many of you, that's a real joke in Nova Scotia, how many of you have ever been to Fort McMurray? Like, yeah, everybody who's been to Fort McMurray. So the whole point is you land at the airport at Fort McMurray, and this is the first thing you see. Most people don't notice this, but this is one of the biggest tripping hazards in that airport because a handrail is supposedly designed so that when you use it, your hand can actually grasp completely around it. Whoever designed this one you know, obviously wanted people to get hurt because there's no way you can grab onto that as you're falling down the stairs. So. By the time I get through the airport, I'm already pissed off, right? And then I'm staying in a camp. They've got me in one of these isolated camps. So I'm in the camp, and uh, I walk in, and I go, oh, look at this. This is a lot nicer than when I spent time in a camp. So what do, you, what do you see here? What do you see? Well, it looks pretty innocent until you walk to it, and it, that's called a shin smasher. So it's designed to smash your shins. That's the only reason that thing sticks out. They cover it to make it look like it's innocent. And then you hit your bloody shin. So if you didn't fall at the airport, now they got you bitching about your shin, right? So what's a fellow to do? Have a shower. You come out of the shower, these guys, are, these guys are trying to kill you. And I said, who the hell designed a shower so that when you come out with your right hand, it gets caught on the sink? I said, that's probably because I'm right-handed. What about left-handed people? Well, these engineers are so good, they catch you whether you're left-handed or right-handed. So by then, I'm going, I'm, a, I'm here to talk to these people about safety, and I've only been here less than four hours, and look at all the dangers that I found. And there was thousands of others. So the whole point is, back in 1975, and yes, that is me, that, remember in 75, the Mod Squad, 
I want it to look like the black guy, the guy with the, uh, the big hair and the cool guy. I actually look like the girl as well. So, <laughs> so the whole point is back in the 70s, I worked for a Canadian Bechtel at Mildred Lake as Syncrude was just starting up. So my background is I've worked in the Arctic putting in hydroelectric stations. So we put in this hydroelectric station for Northern Canada Power Commission. And back then I was just a young guy. And back then safety really didn't you know, have a big thing to play within industry. And uh, people getting killed left, right, and center. And uh, as we were building this power station, these are the uh, entrance to the penstocks where the water is going to go down the turbine. Uh, oh yeah, w whenever you used to tell a young guy there, wash the vehicle, this is how they would wash the vehicle. Or, or when you told them, can you dump that rock by the side of the road? They would dump the rock by the side of the road. And I've got thousands of slides like this, and they're kind of funny right now. And as long as nobody gets hurt, it's kind of funny, is it? Well, it's not really funny. And when Larry, uh, who was our driller, and his buddy would drill and blow up the rock, once the rock got blown up, then uh, the rock would have to be screened through a grizzly. So a grizzly is, you drive a, a big truck here, and then you build a grate above it made out of steel with eight inch squares, eight inch squares, and then a big front end loader would bring some of that crushed rock and drop it on the grizzly, and anything under eight inches would fall into the truck, and then we'd bring it away and either build roads or build the dam. Well, Larry's brother, who was 17 years old, periodically would go on to the grizzly with a, pro, uh, cry, uh, pro bar, a cry bar and pry rocks that got stuck in there so the next load of rock could be dumped. Well, you can imagine what happened. He was there, a 17-year-old kid, a summer student, loosening the rock, and a big front-end loader, a 988 cat, dropped a big load of crushed rock right onto him. And I was the camp medic at the time. And that's the first time I saw someone die on an industrial scene, and I let the young man die. Uh, I didn't even try and resuscitate him because it would have taken three hours to get a flight out of Yellowknife to get any sort of medical attention, then another two hours to get him out, and I just made a decision that there was no way this young kid would survive, and he didn't. He only lasted about 15 minutes. He had an open skull injury with brain extruding. He had uh, two bilateral pneumothoraces where I could hear the breathing go in and out of the lungs, bilateral fractured femur. He had just about every worst injury. So. I made him as comfortable as I could with, you know, the narcotics that I had, and the fellow died. And then we had to tell his brother, who was the driller, that uh, had brought him in like two weeks earlier, that his, his brother, his 17-year-old kid brother, got killed because the front-end loader, you know, dumped a rock on the kid, never had checked. There was no signal in place letting them know that somebody was there. You know, this, this never should have happened. And I put this in the back of my mind, and I said, this is totally crazy. I mean, how, how can people get killed like this? And, uh, and so I had my brother coming up, and I actually phoned my brother and said, don't come up. I don't want you to come up here. This place is too dangerous. And so I parked that in the back of my mind, and then, long story short, I ended up working in emergency. So most of the time, I work as an emergency physician. I'm a professor at the University of Alberta. I teach injury prevention, and I do a lot of consulting with industry to try and tell them everything I know about how we can keep people from getting hurt. And at the end of the day, it's, it's actually quite simple. I don't know if this has a pointer, but if you take a look at the green box, outstanding safety performance is something that is achievable. So there are companies in the world that have almost reached a level of zero injuries. And they've been able to do that because the main essential cornerstone is they have management, visions, commitment to safety. That's the only reason that company exists. It exists above anything else. And it doesn't matter what industry they are, they're in the safety business, and they happen to either be generating electricity, pulling salt out of the ground, transporting ships, moving oil. That's something secondary. Because any company that wants to make money, focuses on safety, will make plenty of money at the end of the day. And if we, if we narrow it up a little bit, you can see that we need to have a safety-aware, trained, and committed workforce. And that's what I want to talk about today. So we know that there's different elements that are required. And uh, some of the safest companies in the world actually don't have health and safety departments because they've been able to transfer that responsibility to each and every individual within the organization. I don't recommend going there, but that should be the goal of every organization is to pretty well eliminate your health and safety department and transfer that responsibility to each and every employer, transfer it to the union, and transfer it to overseeing bodies like you know, our workers' compensation boards as well. So this is a vision that's true. This is, uh, there's a great book that's been written about this, and I can give you the reference. And uh, we'll talk about 12 of the essential elements of how to get there. Now, 
We've just spent a quarter of a million dollars. In Alberta, the government gave us a quarter of a million dollars because a worker was killed at the work site. It's called Section 41 uh, sentencing. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But if somebody's injured or seriously uh, injured or killed at work, the judge is able to fine the company, and that fine is directed towards group like ours that do something with that money. This person got killed. We were given a quarter of a million dollar to develop this tool that's available for anyone to use around the world. So if you go to survey.injurialberta.com and you go under where it says, I'm a worker, you can actually do an online survey of your work environment and come up with in probably, I think it's like 10 different areas, will do an immediate risk assessment score. So you can actually get the safety culture of your organization like that. You've never been able to do that before. If you've got a company of 1,000, you can go in there and get 1,000 people to take the survey, and you can identify exactly where the problems are within your organization. Now, the only problem is we've built the front end collecting the data. We're looking for partners to help us build the back end so that the data could be abstracted. But we've developed a Ferrari that's right now running at Volkswagen speed because we don't have all the elements in place. But if you go and play with this survey and you say to yourself, wow, this is a powerful tool, then you give us a call and we'll, wor we'll work with you on taking it to the next level and then we'll make that available to everyone else out there. So the goal is to keep building this generic tool that everyone will have access to so that you'll be able to not only compare yourselves with an industry, but you can set, set a benchmark for yourself on March 21st, 2013 for your company and then come back a year later or two years later and reassess yourself as well. If we've got time at the end, we'll play, for it. we'll play with it. But it's a quarter of a million dollars that's been invested in a tool that's now readily available for you to use. You go through there, start the survey, do the survey honestly, and at the end of it, you'll get a whole series of dashboards and it'll tell you exactly the safety culture within your organization. You answer honestly, it's all based on science, you will get a good snapshot of where you're at. All right, that's the introduction. Let's start at the very, very beginning. Most of you can figure what the heck this is. All right, that, that's like, this shows you the power of the female, right? Because the female is the egg, and the male is that little, little swimmy guy there, right? And so this is how you've all start. like nobody ever told you this? This is how life starts. <laughs> you all look like pretty surprised, you know? But this is it, this is the moment where it all starts. And my, and my parents, thank God, they said this is the earliest picture they've got of me. So they, they, they've shared this picture, and I'm sharing it with you. Because within nine months, this is what usually happens. Not all the time, though. As an emergency physician, I can tell you that 25% of the time, most pregnancies end as miscarriages. And there's a reason for that, because the body goes through, it's got a very sophisticated computerized quality control system, and if the fetus doesn't meet the quality control system for whatever reason, then the fetus isn't allowed to continue to develop. And that's why most babies, not all, but most babies when they're born, are born pretty, pretty perfect, considering you go from two half cells to, I don't know how many trillions of cells in nine months, and the most complicated thing on the planet then comes out, all right? And then that's where we screw up, because there's nothing wrong with the majority of kids when they're born. It's what we do to them afterwards that screws them up so that they grow up to be <laughs> you guys, right? All right, so that's when we start looking at the little baby. Now we gotta look at the bigger picture. So the bigger picture is, we've gotta understand what this whole thing is all about. I am the luckiest guy on earth, because last week, last Thursday, at this time, South African time, I was addressing a congress of surgeons from South Africa, trying to get them to understand the notion that the only treatment for trauma <clears throat> is its prevention. Different audience, same message. But you can imagine there was about 300 of them, and I said to them, look, as surgeons, you have to stop looking as, at trauma and treating it. You've got to start preventing it. And so the message was kind of revolutionary, especially in that neck of the woods. But once again, you travel and you really realize how this planet is very, very, very small. Because if I was to take the 7 billion people that live on the planet and shrink them to a village of 100, this is what that village would look like. So I was in Africa, so of that village of 100, 14 would be African, 60, 6-0 would be Asian, 12 European, 8 Latin American, one from the South Pacific, 
And if five are from America and Canada, that means that half a person is representative of Canada. So if you take a village of 100 to represent the population of the world, half a person would represent Canada's imprint. All right? All of a sudden, you look at this and say, wow, I didn't realize we make up such a small percentage of the population. The reason I put that up there is because between Canada and the US, we spend $2.8 trillion a year on healthcare. Now, most of you don't have a clue what a trillion dollars is. Most of you don't have a clue what a billion dollars is. I don't. A million I can sort of kind of relate to. But the magnitude of dollars that are spent on healthcare for that small proportion of a population with the global village is appalling. And when you take a look at it, you know, it's estimated on the bottom that $750 billion of that money spent is totally wasted. Totally wasted in areas of unnecessary services, inefficient delivery, excessive administration, inflated prices, prevention, and fraud. $750 billion is four times the amount of money that's spent on healthcare in Canada every year. Four times. So when I'm in Africa, or when I'm in Kuala Lumpur, or when I'm in no matter where I am, and I show these figures to these people, they just look and shake their heads and go, this is unbelievable. And it is unbelievable when you take a look at the systems that they're working with. So it's nice that we come to these conferences and we're well-fed and well-housed and you know, nice and safe and sound. I can tell you, though, the majority of the world is not living like we live. And so the reality is, of that village of 100, the majority of them would be living in poverty and hungry, without access to electricity, computer, and education, and the basic things that we take for granted. So where does that really leave us? Well, that leaves us with, you really have very, very little to complain about. You really should not ever complain about anything in your life, because we are the most privileged people that live within the current society that exists in this world today. And that's why the responsibility for us is not to sort of take care of our problems here. Our responsibility is to actually think broader and do things to help people that really need our help. Because most of the stuff that we complain about is, is quite frankly, just bitching, all right? It, it's uh, it's kind of silly when you actually listen to it if you've had the opportunity to travel and understand what's going on. Now, this is the end of a day, the end of a long conference. You're exhausted. Your brains aren't working. I can guarantee you that. I've got to reprogram your brains. So I'm an emergency physician. I'm about to reprogram your brains. If there's any side effect, don't worry. We can take care of it. This, this building must have one of those automatic defibrillators. Yeah? OK. You guys know how to use them? All right. So if something goes wrong, we'll just get one of those. We'll zap you, and we'll bring you back, OK? But this is a game you have to play. Red, green, blue, yellow, and black. And the color resolution is pretty remarkable here. This is good. So I want you to start from the top. And you're a little nervous now, I know. We're in Nova Scotia. Nobody likes to talk out loud. So I want you to say red, green, blue, yellow, black. And I'll encourage you to say it louder. You'll say it louder. Then I'll say faster. And then I'll switch the slide. Same colors. I want you to give me the colors. OK? Don't fight it. Just give me the colors. And then I'll show you a third slide. And if on the third slide you see green, I've got you under my spell. Are you good? OK. It only lasts for about 40 minutes. And then I've got 40 minutes to give you the rest of the presentation. You're, <laughs> You ready to play games? Yeah. All right. Red. Louder. Faster, faster. Colors. OK. You're in green? You're in the green zone? All right, I got you. Now. Now that I've got you hypnotized, I've got to find out a bit about you. How many of you are generation, um, silent generation, 25 to 45? Those are birth years. Look at your license plate, quick. <laughs> Put up your hands. How many of you are the silent generation? Oh, we've got a couple. How many of you are baby boomers? I expect a lot of those. How many of you are generation X? Oh, lots. My favorite generation, generation Y. We got any? Can generation Y please stand? Because you are my favorite generation. <laughs> I love generation Y. And, and there's a reason why I've got you standing. And how many are a generation at 95 on? Usually, oh, we got, we got one. You know, when I travel, I like to make sure that there is no question the audience can ask me that I can't answer. And uh, so my graduate students prepare me very well. And they said, where are you going? I said, Nova Scotia. They said, oh, 
we've had, we've heard some problems in Nova Scotia. And I said, what? They said, this Generation Y, they, they really can give you a hard time. I said, are you serious? They said, look, we're doing scouting work for you, Doc. Be very careful. I said, why are they called Generation Y? And they said, whoops, we'll come back. So they came back and they found out why Generation Y is called Generation Y. Do you know? Look at them carefully. This is why Generation Y <laughs> is called Generation Y. And it, you can sit down now. And it's amazing, the majority of them become pipe fitters <laughs> and plumbers. Go figure. So it really doesn't matter what I want to say. What really is important is what you want to hear, all right? So just, I can't do everybody, but just randomly tell me what you want to hear. You've heard a little bit. I've introduced that I've broken the ice. I, I've got a lot of latitude. What do you want to hear in this final presentation of the conference? Just shout it out. Now, one at a time, please. Like I, I, can, I can barely understand all of you talking at once. You keep going because you're very entertaining. Wait, my fly's down? <laughs> okay, what else? We'll keep going. So she likes humor. She likes humor. We'll add humor. Inspiration. We can do that. Beer, yeah. We'll talk about beer and the consequences of beer. What about in the, uh, the cheap seats, way at the back, that couldn't afford a good seat? Blonde lady with glasses trying to avoid me. I got good eyesight. What, what do you want to hear? Education? Is that what you said? OK. All right, I think, I think we can meet your needs. So you're trying to prevent injuries. You may not be able to see these layers from the back, but they basically say pathophysiologic pathways, uh, generic constitutional, individual risk factors, social relationship, living conditions, neighbor communities, institutions, including medical care, social and economic policies. These are the things that are distracting us from being able to prevent injuries, all right? Preventing injuries is not very complicated, but you have to understand that you have to prevent an injury in environments that we all belong to, right? And so unless you have a good understanding of those environments, you're not going to be able to prevent injuries at the end of the day. And that's why it's so frustrating for those of you that are trying to prevent injuries <clears throat> and the numbers aren't going down the way you want them to go down. We'll talk about that. But the things that keep people healthy, let's back up now and assume that we're going to have healthy people that are coming to work. The things that keep people healthy have got nothing to do with the healthcare system. The healthcare system may contribute 20% of your health. 80% of your health comes from these things right here. And the most important one is early childhood development that we're going to talk about in a second. And then the next most important one is the family structure you come from. And then the next most important one is education. Because if you've got education, you'll be able to get a job, you'll be able to have income, income gives you housing, access to good nutrition, social networks, and then the rest of the pieces should fall into place, okay? But these pieces, I can tell you, don't fall into place as easily as they should. Now, as safety specialists, you have to understand what makes people healthy. So you've got to go way beyond your comfort zone now and understand that what we do to a child in the first 18 months of life will determine everything about that child down the road. So the worst thing you can do to a child under the age of 24 months is expose them to any kind of video game or television because the television will actually rewire the circuitry in their brain. So if you really want to screw up a kid, put him in front of a television under the age of 24 months. Because the evidence now is becoming very, very strong that the signals coming from a TV or a video game are changing too quickly, and the child's brain is trying to process all this. The child's brain is tuned to listen to someone talk to them, right? So the eye-to-eye -eye contact, the touch, the eye, the tactile. Sure, putting them in front of a television frees you up, but it's actually rewiring the circuitry in the brain of a child. And the first 18 months of life, that line in green, are when you have an opportunity to make an impression on a child. If you don't make it in the first 18 months, it's almost impossible to make it later. And we learned from Romania, when uh, kids were freed from Romanian orphanages, if those kids under the age of 24 months were not stimulated appropriately, it doesn't matter what sort of environment you put them in afterwards, you cannot recover those kids. Very few of them recovered well. Most of them ended up in the sex trade. Most of them ended up as drug addicts in the criminal system or committing suicide. Read about it, major problem. And so, unfortunately, we're spending the majority of our money on health, education, social services way too late in the game. I would invest 
any dollar in the penitentiary system, <clears throat> I wouldn't invest it there. I'd invest it in early childhood development because the majority of those people have ended up there as a result of mental illness and poor upbringing. The majority, not all. There are some crooks that are pretty smart. But the majority of people that ended up in our system is because we did not spend enough time in the first 18 months of life. So if you've got kids in your life under the age of 24 months, get rid of the television, spend more time with them, just talking to them, spending time looking at them. This is what's happened to us as a society. For millions of years, we were hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers are constantly on the move, constantly looking for food, constantly doing to the body what's supposed to be done to the body. The most dangerous thing that you're doing today is what you're doing right now. Humans are not designed to sit. Your brain is not working at full capacity. If I was to take all the chairs out of this room, you would absorb 37% more of what I'm saying just by standing. For millions of years, we were hunter-gatherers. And in the last 27 years, we've gone from that to this. And so the brain is totally confused. The brain now is totally confused because the brain is getting a signal that says, great white hunter, you've been a good hunter. Look how much game you've eaten. Right? So the brain is now totally confused as to what to do. And so the brain is forcing signals that say you should be hibernating. And so people in our society today are generally not as happy as they could be. And so people that are not happy want to be happy. Because everything in industry pushes us to be happy. And if you're not happy, they make you feel like you're a loser. And so how do you get happy? All these things make you feel happy instantly. You have a slug of beer or wine, you shoot up some drugs or you do some drugs, you have sex, inactivity, hamburger, salt. All those things make you feel good immediately because it releases endorphins in your brain, right? Now, what a coincidence. These very things that people are doing to feel happy are the very things that force us to require a healthcare system, right? And if that's too complicated, let me simplify it. Take your hand, any hand. Get three fingers working. I want to point out three things. One, point, like say one, smoking. Two, inactivity. Three, poor nutrition, okay? Repeat it so you got it. Smoking, inactivity, poor nutrition. Now, shake your hand so you don't get confused. Now I need four fingers. Those three things contribute to <clears throat> certain cancers, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, and uh, cardiovascular diseases. So three risk factors, smoking inactivity, poor nutrition, contribute to certain cancers, diabetes, uh, chronic pulmonary conditions, and cardiovascular, now that's stroke and heart attack, and those four conditions account for 50%, five zero, of the disease burden. So 50% of why we have to spend $220 billion a year in Canada of your tax dollars, if you're paying taxes, right, of your tax dollars is to go to a healthcare system because of three things that we haven't been able to figure out. You want to make your workforce a safer workforce? Focus on three things. Smoking, inactivity, poor nutrition. Amazingly, those three things will give you people that are far more motivated and far less likely to become injured at the end of the day. Now, you're saying, what the hell is this guy talking about? You should go back to Africa. I will. If I had the chance, I'd go back tomorrow. It's a beautiful country. But the whole point is, we don't understand the big picture. Until you can understand the big picture, you're, you're, you're basically practicing, all right? So my plea to you is to stop practicing and get the skill sets that'll take us to the next level. Now, the one thing that I know this is for a fact, no matter where you go on Earth, this is the most powerful determinant of whether you're a healthy, happy individual. You meet someone for the very first time. Think about this. You meet someone for the very first time. After you have that little chit-chat, you know, how you do in the weather and the rest of it, what do people want to know about you? What do they want to know about you? What do you do for a living? And, and do you think she's really asking you what you're doing for a living? She's going, you know, should I waste my time talking to this guy? Because people are trying to find out where are you on the social ladder, okay? People want to find out where. And it doesn't matter where on the planet you go. And it's not good enough to say, for example, you're a doctor. So you, you two guys are doctors. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm a doctor too. What, what kind of doctor? You're a family doctor? That's good. What kind of doctor are you? 
You're a neurosurgeon kind of doctor that takes a nine-month baby out of a woman's uterus, operates on its brain, and shoves it back in the uterus kind of doctor? Hey, can you get us a drink? I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> or you're an engineer. Well, how big is the thing you developed? Or you're a CEO. How big is the plant? Or you're a model. Where did you model? It doesn't matter what you say. There's this hierarchy in society. And the sooner you understand that within your operation, the sooner you'll understand the vulnerability that some people feel. Now you're saying, holy macro, when are we going to start talking about safety? I'll give you the safety stuff at the end. But unless you understand what makes people tick, it's not going to help you at all. Now, now we're going to get into the real sort of hardcore stuff. What do we all crave as humans? What do we all crave? Who said love? Stand up. You're a genius. That's, that's good, because most people, I actually, somebody give her a hug for me, because that, uh, <laughs> yeah, give her a hug. That's fantastic. You're absolutely right. We crave love. Do we ever talk about love? And guys, ladies, you can stop listening for a second. Guys, there's a difference between love and sex. <laughs> ladies understand this, but guys just still don't get the concept, you know? So there's a big difference. Love is that feeling that you get from an individual or the feeling that you give to an individual. And how many of you have like fallen in love within the last six months? Put up your hand. All right. That you're willing to admit. So the whole point is we know within the first six months there's something really special about it. You can actually measure the hormones and then it disappears after that. So I always tell my growing up teenage horny boys, don't marry any girl till you've at least been with her for six months because something magical happens after that. Now, how many of you are happy? Truth be told, if you were to ask yourself right now, are you happy, you really shouldn't think about it for too long. If you're not happy right now, chances are good you're not going to be happy tomorrow. And so I'm going to talk to you about happiness so that you can get happier. Because this is what happiness is. 50% of happiness is genetic. You either have it or you don't. 10% comes from more stuff. And your homes are full of junk, stuff that you bought thinking it would make you happier. Bigger TV, faster car, younger wife, bigger tits, tighter ass, more hair. <laughs> all stuff that you thought was going to make you happier. And it makes you happier for a little bit, but then you're still that miserable old sod, right? But 40% of happiness comes from volunteering and having strong social support networks. 40%. So if love and happiness is so important, why are we focused on this stuff, thinking that this stuff is going to make us happy? It makes you sort of happy, but not really happy. And so if it's so important, do you have uh, the safety services have a VP of uh, love and happiness? Does your company? Yes. Yeah, you've got one? That's good. Because you should, because this is the kind of stuff you've got to focus on. This is injury prevention. All right? I'm going to start making links that may not become obvious right now, but hopefully eventually they will. Now, I'm going to just take a second here and, and uh, can somebody bring me a, a fresh glass of water? So while they're doing that, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you to do a simple exercise and you're going to fail. I have yet to meet an audience anywhere in the world that is able to do this and pass. So are you ready to take a test that you're going to fail? All right. Follow the instructions to a T. Only do what I say. Only do what I say. Look at the person next to you in the eyes and smile. All right, losers, losers, losers. I told you you wouldn't be able to do it, and you still flunked. What did I say? If you did what I said, it would look like this. Look at the person next to you in the eyes and smile. But you didn't do that. You started laughing. You started feeling good. You started carrying on. You know why? Because you were just pushing drugs. When you look at someone in the eyes and smile, that's drug pushing because the exact same chemicals are released in your brain as if you were to shoot crystal meth, heroin, everything else, right? And so how many of you got a kid at home, a little kid, a baby? Who's got a baby at home? Have you ever done this with your baby? Cuckoo. <laughs> what does the kid do? And how long, how long will that kid do that? Like forever. I travel a lot, and if there's a kid that puts his head up in front of me, I immediately try and avoid contact. Because if that kid looks at me and smiles, and I smile back, and that kid laughs, 
That's it. I've got 12 hours of having to look at that kid and laugh. Because that kid goes, Mommy, Mommy, I found another drug pusher. Watch. This guy looks like Santa. He really makes me feel good. Because every time you look at someone and smile, you get that, whoa, what the hell was that? And you know when you get that as well? When do you get that? When do you get that nowadays? Every time this goes beep, ding, text message. <laughs> Somebody loves me. <laughs> Somebody loves me. I got to go see. <laughs> Somebody loves me. Oh, they love me. They love me. They love me. And that's why when it goes bing, you get that. Whew, it's like a semi-orgasm. And then you got to take a look at it to find out who loves you. Right? And that's why these things are so freaking addictive. They're so freaking addictive. We know that when you get that ping, it makes you feel, wow, somebody loves me. Somebody needs me. And that's when you're about to plow into the car ahead of you or plow into Francis Getty when you hear that bing. And that's why your phone has to be shut off. So I'm going forwards. I'm going backwards. So here's where we really are at today. For a society that's supposed to be so well-connected, we're actually becoming more disconnected, OK? This is what we should be focusing on, having that connection within our family, right? Having that connection within your family. Now, not all families are functional, but if, if you have a semi-functional family, you should be really working on this connection, because this is protective and healthy to you. You know, we're warehousing our seniors. These are people that have an enormous amount of experience within our society. And because of the way society is set up, they're spending a lot of them, <clears throat> their last years, in abject misery. So if you really want to freak your parents out, just phone them tonight to say hello. Not to ask for money, not for anything. Just phone your parents and just say hello. And, and most of the time, you'll get the response. Bobby, what's wrong? Why did you phone me? No, seriously, tell me, what's wrong? You're not getting along with Katie or with Robert or whatever, how your kids, right? Phone your parents while they're still around. Incredibly important. This is my little unit, right? And uh, we work as hard as we can to keep it as tight a nest as possible. And, you know, the boys are now starting to get a little independent. Laura's, Laura's still with us. And that's my bride of 30 years. But the whole point is you've got to focus on the stuff that's close to you because that's the stuff that when you start putting it together makes you who you are. Because if you're in the safety business, you've got to be performing at 120%. Because you're going to be dealing with stuff that really is going to take a lot out of you. And so that means that you and your life have got to be performing in a way that you've never, ever experienced before. If you never...